Okay. Uh, so, first of all, I'd just like to mention about Bankwatch because uh, when I usually when I mention the name, there's a lot of misconceptions that we are able to watch every bank in the whole world, and uh, uh, it's obviously not possible. Uh, we have plenty of work on our hands just monitoring two banks and uh, those are the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development and the European Investment Bank which are two supposedly development banks. Uh, the EIB is, is actually part of the European Union whereas the European uh, Bank for Reconstruction and Development is owned by a wider group of countries than just the European ones. Um, it's also, for example, has America and Australia and so on as its shareholders. So we are primarily um, coming from an environmental focus in Bankwatch. Um, we have 16 member groups spread across Central and Eastern Europe and um, we generally focus on infrastructure construction that has a negative environmental impact. So, I mean, maybe it's not so obvious how did we get interested in PPPs in the first place. But when you look around the region uh, and see actually which kind of PPPs have been implemented in Central and Eastern Europe, then it becomes more obvious. Uh, in the UK, there's been a lot of public service PPPs, but in this region, those are kind of just beginning and there are, it, it depends which country, but the, the main bulk of the PPPs in Central and Eastern Europe has been on motorway construction. Um, as uh, our previous speakers have been saying that PPPs are obviously heavily promoted due to economic interests and also by various institutions, um, the EIB and the ABRD are both, both very big fans of PPPs as well as the European Commission. And there is a host of consultancies, law firms, construction firms, and so on, who are all actively pursuing this uh, policy. But in fact, in the region, the development of PPPs has actually gone a lot slower than, than most of those actors would have hoped. Uh, only Hungary has implemented a huge number of PPPs, over 100. And in this slide, I've just put a, a selection of, of the projects which governments in Central and Eastern Europe have, have tried to implement. Um, the good news is that half of these uh, cases were only attempts which actually ended up failing. Um, in Hungary, there's been PPPs in all kinds of sectors, including prison services, uh, but several motorways projects which uh, the first couple failed. Uh, there wasn't as much, they were toll motorways and there wasn't as much traffic as they were expecting. And then the, the, uh, private, the, the private sector partner then ended up without as much income as they were expecting and they hadn't been smart enough to put some guarantees in the contract. So then uh, at least the first uh, motorway ended up being completely renationalized again at great cost. Um, I won't go through all of these because uh, that would take much more than uh, 20 minutes I have. Um, but these were just to, to, give, um, to give an overview. Um, just to mention also from, from our side as an environmental organization, um, we, we found that as well as the, the other problems associated with PPPs, which, which David has, has briefly outlined, we found that they also bring more problems in terms of trying to solve environmental conflicts because once you have a, a 30 years uh, concession contract in place, if there's, a, if there's an environmental conflict and a government is under pressure, for example, uh, there's been a couple of cases with the motorways, uh, if the government under normal circumstances would say, yeah, okay, we will, we will change the route of this motorway to avoid this protected area or whatever. If there's a 30 year contract in place, they, they can't do it, or at least they will have to make some very expensive changes in the contract to do so. So as, as well as all the, the public budget problems um, with, with PPPs, as well as the fact that the, the projects are terribly bad value for money, 
even even from this ecological point of view, they, they cause a lot of problems with the rigidity of the contracts. And uh, Hungary, as I think, is, as um, they, I'm glad David mentioned Portugal. I think that's a really entertaining example with even the IMF becoming a bit skeptical about PPPs. Uh, Hungary is also an example of a country that had to learn the, the hard way. Uh, I think it, it, they were not counting at all how much, how much infrastructure they had bought on their PPP credit card. And uh, when the crisis came along, they, they found out pretty quick. And, um, and now there's been various, uh, various Hungarian governments in the last few years, but they, they've stuck now to, to a policy of having a moratorium on, on new PPPs and also reviewing some of the existing contracts. So um, we've, we've heard uh, lots about what's going on in the UK, which I think is, is pretty important as one of the countries which is, has a huge amount of um, experience with privatization. But I also wanted to, to bring the story down to a very local level um, and give a couple of examples from here in Zagreb. Um, Basically, they are, they are quite sort of unsexy examples, and that's partly because we don't have that many PPPs here to discuss, but also partly because I wanted to encourage people uh, to, to take notice of those projects which are kind of boring and you wouldn't usually, uh, you wouldn't usually think of uh, making a campaign against them or you wouldn't usually think of taking big interest in them, but even, even in these cases, there's a lot of murky figures hiding behind them. So the first one is this uh, very shiny space age wastewater treatment plant, which we have here. Um, the EBRD was involved in this project, unfortunately, long before Bankwatch started to work in Croatia, so we, we missed the boat with that one. Um, they gave the loan in 2001. The plant started to operate in 2004, and it was uh, seen as something quite positive as far as I've heard from people who were here at the time sort of know, know what there was no serious, uh, you know, people felt that there was a need to, there was a need to have wastewater treatment and so on in Zagreb, so no one was really looking too closely at the figures. Except there was a, um, there was an expert committee which was appointed by the city of Zagreb to, to examine the project. And they said, hang on, no, this is a stupid idea because you, the drainage system in Zagreb at the moment is done in a way that all the water just comes down from Medvenica, all that rainwater and stormwater, it all gets mixed up with the city wastewater, and then it would go to this really massive treatment plant. It has to be massive if it's going to treat all the rainwater from Medvenica. And then actually there's no need for it. It would be better to take a few years, redo the drainage system, and then just build a small treatment plant for the actual amount of water that really needs to be treated so that you're not paying to treat rainwater. So the, um, the reaction of the city council was to say, hey, you're talking shit, um, shut up. And they just stopped working with this expert commission and built, this, um, built a plant anyway. So the private concessionaire in this, in this um, project is a mixture of Austrian and German companies with 3% ownership by, by Vorda Privred de Zagreb, part of the Zagreb holding. Um, and the price increases during the project have been enormous because basically they didn't plan the project very well and then they keep through the years discovering bits that are still missing and having to, to add them on. So it started in 2001 being 176 million euros, or double that in Deutschmarks as it was. Um, and then it was, um, in 2007, the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development named a figure of 326.7 million. And still in 2012, the city of Zagreb is only admitting that it cost 299 million. So the actual real price of this investment is a, still a, pretty much a complete mystery. Um, 
the only thing that you can see is that even, even by the city's own admission, the, the price has risen uh, by more than 100 million euros. And um, still, I mean, there's, there's constantly bits being added onto this project, but still today, people who live along the side of the, uh, the drainage canal that leads to the wastewater treatment plant, are still they haven't even got a cover, concrete cover over this smelly channel that goes to the plant. So, so a lot of this, um, these things that were supposed to be part of the project in the beginning, they haven't even been done yet and still new things are being added. And then there was a question of why was this a PPP in the first place? And I think this, this question is uh, mysterious um, when you look at how much has actually been paid off. Um, again, I mean, we did manage to get part of the contract for this project, but I think all the interesting, juicy information is in the annexes. We, we didn't find anything especially um, secret in the, um, in the contract itself. But um, the Croatian state auditor has drawn attention to this uh, project a couple of times. And one of the, the pieces of information from the auditor is that uh, from April 2004 till the end of 2006, already 75.5% of the construction costs had already been paid. So why did they do it as a PPP? Because usually the idea of PPP is that okay, we can buy infrastructure now which we can't afford and we can pay it off over 30 years at a more expensive rate, but we can kind of, we can postpone the cost till the future. But in this case, anyway, the city had to pay almost the, uh, like con the whole construction co cost within a couple of years, so they could have actually just taken a loan and built it themselves. So, so this is pretty mysterious still. Uh, some of you might also have heard about the, the problems that were caused um, with some of the businesses in Zagreb not wanting to pay the, the uh, fees for this water treatment plant, such as the Diocchi and Coca-Cola. Um, that was because those companies, they had their own wastewater treatment facilities, and they felt like they've already paid for their wastewater treatment, so they didn't want to pay twice. But since the contract obliges the city of Zagreb to be responsible for all the income for the treatment plant, the city ended up using the taxpayers' money to cover the costs that the businesses wouldn't pay. Uh, there's another technical issue with the plant about the treatment of the sludge. And in theory, there is, there is this... Uh, this facility called anaerobic digester, which should make this sludge into some kind of compost, not really something that you could use for growing your vegetables, but something that could at least be used for like covering up the landfill or some, that it could be, have some kind of use. But for some reason, the Zov, this company that runs the plant, for some reason, they've installed an anaerobic digester that doesn't do the process until the end. And so, coincidentally, one of, the, one of the companies, which is part of Zov, EVN from Austria, coincidentally, they're the same company that then is pushing the city of Zagreb to build an incinerator because they are saying, well, we have to build an incinerator because we have all this sludge that we have to do something with. And if they had just built the anaerobic digester as they were supposed to in the first place, that it would process the sludge until the end, this, this excuse wouldn't exist. In any case, burning sludge in an incinerator is a totally bizarre idea, which we could talk about at some other opportunity. But uh, basically, this seemed to be just kind of, kind of case where they are just kind of creating future business opportunity for themselves. Let's, let's put it mildly. Um, so to conclude on this case, um, it turned out this year, according to media reports at least, that the city of Zagreb owes to Zov 180 million euros, uh, partly because of these businesses that didn't want to pay, partly because of 
other businesses or other households that don't pay. So all this idea that with the public-private partnership, you are like transferring some of the risk to the private sector. In, in this case, it's clear that there is no risk, really, because the city is still responsible for gathering all the fees. Okay, so I have one more case study, but I don't know if I've got time to... I think I'd better not talk about that, right? Five. Five. Oh, well. Then I might manage. Okay. So I'll, I'll briefly uh, go through this one. This famous Arena Zagreb, I think, I think more people are aware that there's a problem with this uh, project, but maybe, maybe it's good to kind of follow it a bit chronologically. Um, this is a project that is run by this Ingra Tree Granite Consortium. Um, built for the handball championships in 2009, um, but already in, in, it was finished and opened early in 2009, and by July in that year, they'd already managed to get 600,000 euros of debt. Um, as often with these kind of infrastructure projects, there was a huge, huge overestimation of, of the income that would result from the project uh, from the users. Some bright spark imagined that this arena would be occupied with events for 212 days every year, which of course turned out to be completely unrealistic. Um, there's a set price of 7.5 million per year from the city of Zagreb to be paid, so again, there's not much risk for the, for the company itself. Um, but in 2010, it turned out that the maintenance costs were again much higher than they were expecting, at uh, 1.2 million. And the city of Zagreb stopped paying, and there was some kind of a dispute about what they should pay and when. And actually, the arena was temporarily closed um, until Zagreb came up with the money. So they, Zagreb eventually uh, paid, but when, when they paid, they basically admitted that this, uh, this whole project could have been done for one third of the price if it wasn't a public-private partnership. And they also uh, said they are looking into the idea of buying back the arena from, from Inga Trigranit. So basically, we have two public-private partnerships in Zagreb, and both of them are really, really bad value uh, for the for people who live here, and those, uh, those projects are still ongoing. So, I mean, just because they are built, it doesn't mean we don't have to do anything. We're, we're still paying for those for, for years to come. So just uh, to close, um, I wanted to, to tell a bit of good news that I discovered recently, because, I mean, uh, recently there's really not much <laughs> good news, but there's at least something here. Um, Across Europe, it turned out recently that the PPPs are at their lowest level for, for 10 years. Um, only seven EU states closed PPP deals in the first half of this year, which when you think, okay, there's 27 countries and, and there's institutions constantly going blah, blah, blah about PPPs, it's, it's really a huge reduction um, compared, to, compared to a few years ago. Uh, the problem is, of course, that the Croatian government hasn't been looking next door to, to Hungary to see what's been happening there, and is still pretty keen on, um, on pushing further PPPs. Um, there's, there's a list of some of the upcoming projects on the, um, on the web page of this agency for public-private partnerships, which you can see the link on the presentation. And... Um, International institutions, of course, and the EC and everyone still haven't learned their lessons, so they're still heavily encouraging these, these models. And uh, finally, I just wanted to mention that there's also, unfortunately, a new boost coming from the European Commission and the European Investment Bank, which is something called Project Bonds, which is going to be kind of a mechanism for guaranteeing PPP projects. So again, there's, there's going to be heavy pushes coming in the next few years to, to kind of prop up these projects, which are so supposed to be private sector, but again, it's going to be the public sector which is putting the money forward to guaranteeing 
the private income again. So yeah, there is uh, there is good news, but uh, we we still need to to keep um, watching what's going on and and to figure out also those cases that we have locally, which are you know for the next 20 years going to cost us loads of money. So that's it from me. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot for your presentations. I had a question to well the the whole panel actually because it's uh, related to, um, to to the the flows of the PPPs. Um, I've been studying them a lot myself, and uh, it keeps really striking me uh, how it is possible that um, well public officials and politicians can actually sign such dodgy deals. Of course, you can always blame the the morale. And uh, indeed, uh, the water and construction sectors are prone to corruption and all these things, and that's public knowledge. But you cannot explain an entire phenomenon by moral issues. Um, and so, I, I wanted to know your 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 advice, but to your opinion, basically, on what could be uh, strategic uh, items to to campaign on to to counter this, be it uh, a reform of the accounting plans so that you have to disclose the total debt and not only the annual debt, for instance, so that you make appear the total cost of the project in. Uh, so that's one, one option. The other option would be to to how on earth uh, reinforce the uh, well government themselves with expertise so that they are properly counseled and don't have to rely on private consultants that are systematically in a position of conflicts of interest to, to, to do that. It's just uh, open ideas, but I, I wanted to, to, know, to know your opinion on this. Yeah, um, well, to, to answer the question of why these bad deals are signed, um, I mean, just to speak about Central and Eastern Europe, I think mean, corruption is definitely well up on the list. Um, there's been a number of the, the ones I showed on the, on the slide with the, with the projects, a number of them didn't even have any tender process. So... I mean, that's, that's pretty much as obvious as you can get. But um, definitely there is a heavy problem with, with inexperience of the public sector um, and, and sort of on kind of inability to recognize their inexperience. I mean, for the wastewater treatment plant in Zagreb, I, I heard, I mean, very kind of unofficially, that when they had the kind of negotiations for the contract, there was like the city and the one lawyer and then the private sector guys and their 12 fancy Western European lawyers who've, you know, done 100 PPP contracts before. So it's not very surprising that the, that the end result turns out like it does. And the other thing is the, the complexity of the deals, which I didn't mention in the presentation, but I think one of the most ironic things about the PPPs is the, the complexity of the preparation and the need to pay these private consultants means that they are usually, like usually have the public authority paying the private consultant who prepares a contract to screw the public authority. So, I mean, that's putting it a bit bluntly, but um, it's usually, um, usually so complex that you would never, you would never train a public sector in a country you know in smaller economies like Croatia or other countries in the region you would never train the public sector to to actually um, avoid these very worse deals by doing the job themselves and but the problem is that there is I think strengthening the capacity of the public sector generally is is crucial in in um, in project development generally but the problem is that what's happening in the region and is being pushed a lot by, by these international institutions um, is that there is an effort to strengthen the ability of the public administrations to do PPPs, not, not to develop decent projects that will serve the public interest. And I think this is a, this is a huge problem because obviously if you have things like countries setting up a PPP agency or a PPP unit, I mean, that, that body has to prove that it's doing something. So it's kind of automatic that they're going to make sure that there's an, enough PPPs coming through the pipeline. So, so I think if, if we're going to um, 
advocate and we have to advocate for for improvements in the in the public administration we have to be careful that that we are formulating it properly in what we want we don't want them just to learn how to do slightly better PPPs so I think that's something we need to avoid um, and yeah I think um, definitely about disclosing the real costs is, is crucial and about where are those costs going to be paid from because I mean the costs themselves are quite abstract they're going on for the next 30 years um, but you know which budget are they going to come out of who who's concretely paying for that and there was the example of the D1 motorway in Slovakia where actually this information the the project became quite controversial and the information was disclosed and and like uh, David said with this public sector comparator uh, comparator uh, figure where they've where they've decided to do the PPP on the basis that they they claim it's cheaper than the the public sector option they they actually did release some of the figures on how they got to that conclusion and that's quite good for a start because then you can look at it and say hang on no that's that sounds pretty dodgy and that's really what happened the the um the project failed in the end in Slovakia because there was a lot of political opposition to the project from from in, like uh, opposition political parties mostly and there was a there was a delay with the project because of uh, some environmental um, issues and then in the end uh, the project was delayed just long enough and the government changed and then the new government cancelled the project more or less so so um, I think it's very this transparency thing it always sounds a bit boring kind of campaigning for transparency but it's really actually it's really important especially in these uh, smaller countries where the, the amount of documentation might be still just about manageable I mean sometimes you have PPPs which are so enormous that even if you got the contract release you would need a whole team of lawyers to read it so it's not always the the um, the key to everything but I think that's a really good start once you have data to argue about you are on a lot stronger ground for trying to stop the whole process um, is there any case of um, disclosing the the contracts uh, through uh, public private partnerships so is there any cases of uh, public getting to know these informations and um, to your knowledge uh, and the second is, what happened, because we don't know these uh, uh, specific articles uh, of uh, such contracts, what, what, do, what do you think, what would be the legal consequences of uh, willing to cancel these type of contracts? Or they have uh, provisions within these contracts that ban uh, certain possibility of uh, avoiding or is this the only case or uh, possibility to go with this uh, buying again on very uh, bad, uh, bad uh, conditions? There have been contracts disclosed, uh, particularly in Scotland, where the Freedom of Inform Information Act is being interpreted differently. In England, uh, a clause known as commercial confidentiality is used to say that It'll, that'll disadvantage the corporations who cannot release the data. In Scotland, they've taken a different view, but that doesn't give us many contracts. Uh, the general release of contracts will, there is quite a few out there, you can get them on the internet, but they've all got their financial model. This is the key thing, the financial model has, has been excluded from release. And until you get that, you don't really know what's planned. And your second point, it's in the financial model uh, that you will get the financial penalties for early termination. And you will have a contract, uh, the legal contract will have a termination, an early termination clause, and it will specify the cost to the public authority of terminating a contract. And the standard contract, is that the contractor is paid the profits that they expected to make over the full life of the contract in the event of an uh, uh, in the and that will happen even if contract termination is a result of the contractor's own poor performance it's absolutely astonishing the protection that's in there but uh, even getting hold of that clause may sometimes be difficult um 
Yeah, there was also a case, um, I think, at the beginning of this year in Berlin where they uh, managed to get the, the uh, contract for the water and that, that gave some very interesting findings that people hadn't been aware of before. And I think I'm right in saying that in, the, in Serbia, in the Horgos Požega motorway case, I, I believe that the, the contract was released and that, that was kind of a demand of the political opposition who was questioning that project. And once the, uh, once the contract was released, it didn't take them that long to, to manage to get the project cancelled. So, yeah, there, it, also in this region there have been those examples. <laughs>